Okay, so um, a, a little bit of a repeat on uh, uh, what we were just talking about. Um, from a mechanistic approach, the resolution of our grid affects the data that we're going to model with. So if we use this standard data thinning procedure where we take our distribution data and then we just take one presence per pixel, then the size of our grid directly affects how many presences we're going to have when we build our model. So in this case, we've got a fine grid and we've got each one of our points fits exactly within one pixel. But if we then remodel this using a coarser grid, okay, where each pixel size is larger, then we end up using just two data points, so two presence points. Okay? So just from a sort of the mechanical process of how we model, the size of our grid, okay, whether we've got a one kilometer grid or a uh, you know, 10 kilometer grid, affects the amount of data we're going to use to input into a model. So we need to think about our current data and what we know about our current data when we choose the resolution of our environmental data. So this is, this is a mock-up of an example from, from my um, work. A lot of our distribution data from uh, deep sea organisms doesn't come from really expensive sampling where we you know, dropped an ROV down and we picked up a trawl. It comes from trawl data, bycatch, okay? And, and the data that we have for these is we've got X number of corals picked up in a trawl. And what we know about this trawl is it started at this point and it finished two kilometers away, okay? So we've got a very wide spatial uncertainty on the location of our samples. So this is the representation of that uncertainty, where we've got a line that represents our trawl line, and we've got a point that we're saying is representative of where we picked up these corals, but really we don't know, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. We have to choose a location to represent that, 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 where that sample came from. So if we have something with a large uncertainty, and that uncertainty is larger than our grid, then it's quite likely that our point that's representative is going to fall in you know, two, two places, or you know, it's going to be in the wrong place, because half of our samples might have come from this part of the trawl, and half of our samples might have come from this part of the trawl, and we can't really determine where that's coming from. Now, obviously, the course of our grid the less likely we're going to have this, this instance where we're spanning multiple pixels. Yeah. And so this kind of spatial uncertainty on our current data should help us um, uh, think about what resolution of our data grid should be so that we're trying to minimize the case where we, we're basically not certain which pixel our, our data should come out of. Now, yesterday, Rob was talking about, in this sort of instance, we might say that spatial correlation is our friend, mm -hmm. in that if this pixel and this pixel never differ very much, then it maybe doesn't matter. But this is something that we need to be aware of, and we need to make a conscious decision that, okay, well, I understand that there's uncertainty in this data, uh, but I've looked at the autocorrelation between these areas and I've made the conscious decision that I'm going to accept that kind of error in my model. And if you're not happy with that, then you should move to a coarser grid so that you say, well, okay, well, most of my data I'm going to be positioning and, and getting data that's appropriate for that area. Okay? So understand the uncertainties in your data, the spatial uncertainty of your distribution data, because that should have, that, that should influence your decision over the coarseness of your environmental grids.
Okay. Um, so another thing about the coarseness of your grid, okay, whether you've got large pixels or small pixels, um, is uh, what you're going to get out from your predictions. So here's an example of uh, some things that I'm, I'm looking at in the UK. This is St. Margaret's Bay on the Kent coast. And this is approximately the area of seaweed distribution. Okay? And I'm trying to model seaweed distribution. Okay? And with coastal species, what you tend to get is long, thin distributions along the coastline. But now, imagine that my pixel size is the blue square. Yeah? So this is, this is the resolution that I can make my predictions area-wise. Okay? So any time that I say that this area is uh, predicted as present for my target species, I'm overestimating, massively overestimating the area. Okay? Because when we're dealing with coarse grids, all we can say is that you know, we're predicting presence, we're predicting absence, or we're predicting the probability of presence or you know, the relative index for this pixel. And uh, there are lots of studies that show that the coarser your grid, the more likely you are to inflate the area that you're predicting as present. Okay? So keeping in mind this example, we can say that seaweeds are here, but obviously this doesn't represent the true area of the seaweed in the location. So here's a study that for us to uh, 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 demonstrate this by modeling, again, these are coral occurrence on um, mounds in the um, north, uh, uh, northwest Atlantic, northeast Atlantic, sorry. Um, and here we've got a series of models using different resolution of grid. And this is the classic pattern that we expect, but that fine resolution, so each pixel is 50 meters by 50 meters, we get a detailed map of distribution that is um, ideally more reflective of reality. But as our pixels coarsen, we end up with a larger area being predicted as present. Okay? And so at this point, we're really over-predicting the area. And this pattern here is the same thing, but this is the total area predicted as present. Okay? We get this. Normally, we get this pattern where the coarser your grid size, the more area you end up predicting. Yeah. So, you are mostly dealing here with sessile species, so they don't move them up to corals or plants or seaweed. Yes. So, if I have island wild species, this 50 meter grid for me doesn't work, for example, because the point when I saw the animal, it doesn't mean that the animal cannot move around. So maybe I have to look on a wider look. So it yeah. does depend on the species. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so sometimes it's better to work on a cost of resolution than on... Yes, so um, uh, exactly. It, it really depends on your thing. So if you've, got, if you've got species that move, then the spatial uncertainty on your observation, you know, you've seen it here. 10 minutes later, you see it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so... Yeah, um, choosing your grid sliders is not just about, yeah, it's about understanding what your organism is and what impact it has on that. And I, I think this is really exciting to see that there might be scaling relationships of how estimates of suitable areas can depend upon the resolution. And I think that that really could be very critical for you know, conservation assessments that use actual numbers um, yeah. in square kilometers. Um, so this is it's really exciting. The other thing is thinking about your um, question. And when I think when you are interested in modeling something about suitability where your pixels are smaller than the home range of the species, um, Maybe what you're doing is something analogous um, to, to the general situation, but a little different, because instead of predicting areas where populations can survive and persist, which is our general paradigm, maybe you're really doing something more like um, 
modeling areas where they're likely to be very active or frequent. Yeah. So you're kind of modeling usage <laughs> rather than the traditional Sweet. sense of suitability for populations. And I think that extension is very valid, but, but one of the reasons why it is different is this issue of movement of individuals based or compared to the resolution of the grid that, that Chris is getting at. So you may have to modify things occasionally in your project from the classic perspective. Yeah. I think that the availability of, of digital cartography <coughs> is a danger for, for this kind of model because you mix a, a, a lot of, of different information, uh, ge geographic information that has been produced at different scales with different purposes. And, and now with the GIS segment, you can overlay all the data, you can put all together and make a sort of analysis that is not a real analysis. That's why uh, I think this point is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Lots of things are good, but you need to understand it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But unfortunately, the pattern of course of scale leading to overprediction doesn't always hold. So. Same, same paper, another series of uh, coral mounds in the northeast Atlantic, okay? <coughs> These ones are a small <coughs> chain of mounds, corals on top of the mound. Um, These are called the old mounds, um, just south of the um, uh, Rockwell Trough. And for this particular instance, we get the exact opposite pattern, okay? Where as we course in our grid, 50 meters through to 1,000 meters each pixel, okay? We get less and less area being predicted as present, okay? The, the, the reason for this in this case is that the size of our features, okay, are really small. And by the time you get to a coarse grid, the, they're basically vanished in the background. So, right. so draw this. At the point we've got a small hill with some coral on top. <coughs> when we're looking at a, a, a grid size that, you know, where the mound represents most of the grid, we can pick that up. When our pixel is this size, yeah? Then that little that little part is you know tiny in relation to the rest of the grid. And whatever the environmental conditions here, they're getting completely masked by the average of that pixel. Okay? So in this case, as our grid courses, we get less and less area being predicted as present. So although this is the pattern we most commonly see. It really depends on the characteristics of the species and the area and what's controlling the distribution and the scale that that is, that that is changing um, in, in order to see the pattern that occurs. So, um, another thing that we want to think about in, in terms of the scale is that the scale of the environmental variable, okay, what we're, what we're extracting from that environmental variable differs depending on the scale that we're looking at. So the example uh, uh, from this study is looking at terrain parameters. And terrain parameters such as slope of oh, Rugosity, the relative um, uh, roughness of the surface. Actually, what we're what we're what we're examining is dramatically different depending on the scale of the analysis that we're looking at. So, if we're looking at a coarse grid and we're looking at a slope on a coarse grid, what we end up with is um, big scale features. So, on a coarse grid, we're going to pick up 
the continental slopes. We're going to pick up the sides of the mountains. Okay? On a fine scale grid, we're going to pick up local scale features. Okay? Uh, and little, little, little mounds and little hillocks. Okay? So, the, that we call this slope and we're looking at it at different scales. We're really looking at different th features. We're picking up different things. And we need to keep this in mind that our, environment, uh, our environmental data, you know, we're really looking at different things when we're looking at different scales. Um, and in the case of terrain parameters, like slope and uh, uh, aspect and uh, 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 rugosity and these kind of things, um, we need to keep this in mind when we're using them. And we can also, we can turn one parameter, that is slope, into multiple parameters, which are slope at different scales. Okay? We, um, no. No. I'll, I'll use this, this area. Sorry. We, um, Traditionally, things like slope and uh, these other terrain parameters are calculated based on a nearest neighbour pixel grid. So this is our target area and we calculate the slope by examining the neighbourhood window all around it. And we're saying that, okay, well maybe this number is highest and uh, this number is lowest and then we can say that, okay, there's a slope going in this direction. Okay? And then the slope here is based on the numbers of the surrounding areas. But we can calculate the slope by looking at the immediate pixels around it, or we can extend this and look at the nearest um, two sets of pixels. Okay? So we're going to look at a bigger neighbourhood window <coughs> in calculating this parameter. And in this case, perhaps uh, you know, there's a there's a, uh, a taller feature here, and then our slope direction is going to change. Yeah. So the terrain parameters are dramatically affected by slope, and we can get different things by looking at different resolutions of grid. Okay. So we need to keep this in mind when we calculate these parameters. Okay. And there's uh, there's GIS packages that allow us to calculate slope based on nearest neighbourhood or a coarser um, or a, a larger grid size, and we get different environmental data out of this. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last of the slide on scale, but. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is taken from a study of Pierce and Dawson, 2003, really heavily cited um, um, paper that looks at the importance of different classes of environmental parameters. And according to the scale that you're looking at. So, climate features like temperature. These tend to operate, and these tend to be important on larger scale, so we know that um, uh, you know, at the equator it's hot and there are sort of certain conditions there, and uh, uh, you know, larger distances we have colder temperatures and we get different things in, uh, according to those, but temperature varies over larger distances. Okay. As we get down the scale, different parameters become important. So one of the uh, one of the criticisms of say distribution modelling or uh, uh, habitat suitability modelling on plant species is that climate is a uh, temperature is restrictive on a larger scale, but really on a local scale other things are more important. So if you've got the temperature parameters, whether a plant is growing in this location really depends on the soil that is there, or whether there's a, you know, there's a, the, the, uh, or the underlying geology 
Okay, so chalky soil versus soil. And this can operate on a really, really micro scale. So whether you find an organism in a location, uh, you know, on a really local scale, might be dependent on a completely different set of factors of whether it's growing in this country or this region. Yeah. So there's this, there's this um, change of scale and the change of importance of variables depending on the scale that you analyze. Okay. So we need to be careful, of, or we need to be mindful of what the scale of the analysis is and which parameters we think might be important at the scale that we want to do our analysis. Well, if you're looking at temporal things, it will reverse the, the scales. For instance, if you're looking at spatial models, yeah. climate is a spatial thing then. So if I'm, I'm not, if I'm modeling things in the equator, I don't care about the climate in the poles. Yeah. But if I'm, if I was modeling climate change, mm -hmm. then that might be useful because climate may, might change. So yeah. it brings the global scale to the local scale. Yeah. The other thing, the other thing that means to keep in mind on, on the, the sort of climate data is what the what the data is measuring. And uh, within our pixel, so which might be 50 meters, one kilometer or, or more, what we've got is a representation of the climate within that area, but it tends to be an average. So in terms of temperature, we might expect you know, local scale fluctuations within our grid that might also affect the, the local distribution. But what we're actually measuring in the data that we have is just an average for that area. So why we think temperature is important for determining our local distribution, it, it might be that our environmental data can't pick up that important variation because, it's, because of the way it's measured. Okay, so um, to summarize, the extent of your summary area is important. Um, the, uh, and we've seen that uh, several times now. Um, the resolution of the environmental data impacts very variable importance. So um, which variables that come out as most important might depend on the, the, the coarseness of the grid that you're using for your analysis. Um, higher resolution is not always better. So, um, you know, just because you can get a one kilometer grid or a 10 meter grid doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get something better out of it. It really depends on your organism, your area, and what question you're trying to ask. Um, and simply trying to upscale low resolution grids into a higher resolution so they fix some of the other data sets isn't necessarily going to produce anything useful, especially if you've got this mismatch of the scale of importance of variables and you know, uh, interpolating a temperature layer just so that it fits your topography is. is um, in, in many ways, um, pointless if the temperature doesn't doesn't really vary over that resolution. Okay, um, and it's always good to understand the influence that your choice of scale has on your analysis. So keep this in mind when you're choosing what environmental data to analyze. <coughs>